Trapped 400 feet below the surface of the North Sea, saturation divers Tony Prangley and Michael Ward were running out of air and freezing. Their lifeline to the surface had been severed and rescue was delayed by a storm raging on the surface. This is the Canopus Star Saturation Diving Disaster. On November 26, 1978, the Star Canopus was providing dive support to the offshore oil platform, the Barrel Alpha, and the nearby semi-submersible platform, the Hakone Magnus. The divers Michael Ward and Gerald Tony Prangley were positioned 334 feet below the Star in a dive bell. These divers were saturation divers. As saturation divers, they would stay submerged for extended periods with the same pressure as the surrounding water. This way, they could leave the bell to perform work and not have to resurface where decompression would be required. Since they stayed at depth, they basically stayed in this bell until their work was complete or they could resurface and connect the bell to a pressurized habitat on the surface. Either way, the dive team maintains pressure so they do not have to decompress, saving valuable time and reducing their risk of decompression sickness as they only decompress one time when the work is finished. In this case, there was no submerged habitat. The divers lived in the pressurized habitat on board the star. They would enter the bell attached to the habitat and be lowered to the working location at depth. When the work for the day was finished, they would be raised back to the habitat and reconnected. The divers, Michael and Tony, were there to establish a connection between the well bore on the ocean floor and the drilling platform. Their task was to connect a six inch flow line to the riser flange. The riser flange was located at 334 feet below the star and 60 feet above the floor of the North Sea. The North Sea is extremely harsh, particularly in the winter months, and this was November. In fact, it was standard practice at the time to halt all diving operations in the North Sea during winter. However, oil production was down in 1978 and dive work had been delayed. Mobile Oil, as well as other oil companies in the North Sea, had decided to stay in operation during the winter months to take advantage of openings in the weather. On November 25, 1978, the bell was at 334 feet when the weather picked up. At approximately 8.30 p.m., the wind began blowing with gusts reaching 40 knots. This was well above the operational range of the star. The star was only a year old and had the most sophisticated control system. While the bell is submerged, the star is controlled by the dynamic positioning system, which is a sort of autopilot that counteracts exterior forces like currents and wind to maintain a somewhat stationary position above the divers. This prevents the star from moving away and causing a dangerous situation for the divers. However, this control system has its limits. And one of these limits is wind speed. If the wind is sustained over 20 knots during operation, dive operations must be stopped. And on November 25th, they were. The forecast predicted these wind speeds and at 8.20 p.m. the gusts increased and the bell was pulled back up to the surface through the moon pool and secured to the habitat. Later that night, at midnight, dive supervisor Robert Kelly came on duty and because the weather had subsided, commenced dive operations. The divers of the next shift, Tony and Michael, were ordered into the dive bell and to prepare for work. Though the wind speeds had decreased, the forecast predicted a shift in the wind direction later that morning, which could cause high wind gusts. With this in mind, the divers were lowered to the work zone to continue work. At 3.12 a.m., Michael Ward exited the dive bell, swam to the concrete wall, and found the pipe flange just in time for dive supervisor Kelly to radio down to return to the bell due to unsafe conditions. Forty minutes later, Michael got the call that things had cleared up and it was time to go back to work. He again exited the bell, found the pipe flange, and began attaching the flow line. Above. The star's wind speed indicator was reading a 15 to 20 knot headwind, which was near the limits of the vehicle but completely controllable. For nearly two hours, everything went as planned while Michael worked on the pipe fitting. However, at 5.45 a.m., as predicted, the wind shifted and began blowing from the north. But the intensity of the wind was much more than expected. The wind nearly instantly went from a 15 to 20 knot headwind to 40 knots against the broadside of the ship. A manager on the star would later comment on the wind conditions. When this wind arrived, it arrived without any warning, and it was not like a sudden gust of wind or a passing squall, which then died down. It started blowing suddenly at 40 knots and then remained at that level for a considerable period of time thereafter. It was a very strange occurrence, to say the least. 
The star was blown sideways, crashing into the Magnus platform. The star's mast slammed into the crossbeam of the Magnus, snapping the mast in two. The captain, Roy Forsyth, turned off the dynamic positioning system and began to pull the bow of the ship around to avoid grounding the ship on the giant pontoons of the Magnus. The dive abort indicator on the bridge lit up. The captain pressed the dive abort alarm and called to dive control. In the dive control room, a warning light and an alarm activated by the captain alerted Kelly to the danger. He immediately radioed the divers, told them to stop work and prepare for ascent. Michael stopped working and swam back to the dive bell, while Tony, inside the bell, pulled up Michael's umbilical. As the captain was trying to get the ship under control, again the dive abort indicator lit up, and the captain called down to Kelly in dive control, relaying the urgency of the situation. Kelly again called down to the bell to check on the divers, to discover that the bell was still not sealed and could not be retracted. Tony had been pulling in Michael's umbilical, but it was now stuck on something. They could not close and latch the door until the umbilical was all the way in. Tony suggested diving out to unsnag the umbilical, but Kelly told him that there was no time and that that was not an option as it was too dangerous. As they tried to unsnag the umbilical, the bell was swaying violently in the water. The captain again called down to Kelly to get the bell up as quickly as possible. Do whatever you have to. Kelly called down to the bell and told them to cut the umbilical and seal the hatch as quickly as possible. Down below, as the divers cut the umbilical, the dive bell slammed into the barrel alpha platform, shocking the divers. Despite the interruption, the divers cut the umbilical and closed and sealed the hatch. They called Kelly and relayed that the bell was ready for retraction. As they retracted the bell, Kelly watched the divers on a monitor in the dive control room. Tony tracked the distance in the bell, calling out the depth every 10 meters. 50, 40, 30. Suddenly, Tony jumped to his feet, waving his arms above his head, yelling, I'll stop. They immediately stopped retraction and Tony stood quietly, listening. From the control room, Kelly could see the moon pool. Instead of the umbilical and the clump weight guide wires hanging straight down, the wires were at an angle toward the bow of the ship. Also, the pulley supporting the clump guide wires was shaking violently until it released, and the video on the monitor was lost. The bell was now falling at approximately 45 miles per hour toward the bottom, 294 feet or 90 meters below. Michael and Tony couldn't do anything to slow or stop the descent. They simply braced for impact. Both divers inside survived the impact, relatively unharmed, but now they were trapped inside the bell on the ocean floor without a lifeline. Above, the crew of the star was just realizing what had happened. When the 40 knot winds pushed the star off course, the lines to the bell had come into contact with the giant anchor chains of the Magnus. As the bell was then retracted, the lines became caught in the chain and snapped. The umbilical supplied breathable air under pressure, electric power, communications, and in this case, most importantly, warm water to heat the bell. Tony and Michael were now trapped in the pitch black bell with no power and no heat. Their air was depleting, but the real danger was the cold. The temperature of the water at this depth was between 0 to 3 degrees Celsius or 32 to 37 degrees Fahrenheit. With no heat, the outside water immediately began cooling the interior of the bell. It was cold, wet, and dark. Furthermore, the location beacon that had been installed on the bell in case of a situation like this had broken on a previous dive and had not yet been replaced. This would slow any chance of rescue as it would be almost impossible to find the bell on the ocean floor. However, there was still hope. The bell was filled with air and therefore was buoyant enough to float. The reason that they were on the bottom is because of the clump weight positioned below the bell. The clump weight was secured by cables that led through guides on the outside of the bell. The clump weight is attached to the bell by secondary locking pins that are removable. If the bell becomes detached from the surface vehicle, the diver should be able to exit and detach the weight, shooting the bell to the surface. This is possible if the bell is equipped with a stage separating the trunk from the sea floor. This bell was not equipped with the stage. The bell had impacted the sea floor on top of the weight in the mud on the floor. The divers could open the hatch, but were met with the sea floor and could not exit the bell. They could not get to the pins to detach the weight. They were trapped, waiting for help. On the surface, the crew knew that they were running out of time to get the divers down and locate the bell, but the storm raged on. Any attempt at rescue would most certainly lead to more deaths. There was nothing they could do but wait. 
After 13 hours, the storm had subsided and divers finally located and attached a line to the bell. The fate of the two divers was instantly known when the bell was lifted from the seafloor and Tony's body fell out of the trunking and floated to the surface. In the end, Michael Ward died of hypothermia and Tony Prangley died of drowning, trying to escape while also severely hypothermic. Since 1978, saturation diving deaths in the North Sea have steadily decreased due to increased safety standards, procedures, and advancing technology. This is True Tragedies. Please like, leave comments, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.